Hi everyone, Shane here from uh, the iMoot team. Um, just wanted to welcome you all here, uh, whatever time of day it is. It's morning where I am, but I'm sure it's evening, midnight, um, whatever. I hope everyone's enjoying the iMoot. I uh, just wanted to give a welcome to um, Michelle and Annie, and um, I guess really just thank them for their time today, for taking the time to share with us today. And I know they both have a great deal of knowledge uh, with Moodle and, and how to use it. So very much looking forward to this presentation. So thank you, ladies. I'll hand over to you. Thanks, Shane. I appreciate that. Um, it's Friday evening here where I am, so I um, can't think of a better way to spend it, right? Hanging out at the iMoot, doing a little Moodle lane. Um, yeah, things like that. And then um, for Annie, Annie, what time is it there in China? Nine thirty in the morning. So, um, yeah, spread all over the globe. So I'll start with introductions um, here with you this evening or this morning or whatever. Uh, my name is Michelle, and um, my partner in crime is Annie Sheffield, and uh, we're coming to you from perspective of uh, doctoral students. We are working on our PhD in learning technologies and uh, that's how we met and have teamed up on a couple of different projects and the presentation today is about one of the projects that we've been that we've been working on related to Moodle. So that. So I want to start with just a little bit of background and information to help frame the project and where all of this comes from. So uh, first of all whether you know this or not, Martin Dugiamas has a vision for Moodle. Um, he defines it really well by saying, Moodle is not meant to be a place where teachers just give you the information. It is meant to be a place where students are creating the information and working together. From the start, that's been Martin's vision for, for Moodle and how he wants Moodle to work. Um, and that falls under the philosophy of social constructionism, um, if you want to put a name to it. So that's how we designed Moodle to work. That's where the core functionality started from. And then over time, it's adapted to accommodate lots of different people's uh, needs. As he talks about Moodle and the way teachers use Moodle, he tends to talk about this typical teacher progression. And if you've seen him give a keynote, you've likely seen him talk about this progression. And I've kind of boiled it down to, uh, to the essence here. But he says, in a typical situation, um, teachers would evolve their use in Moodle to start with resources and SCORM and content delivery. They might graduate up to uh, passive forums like the news forum, using that for announcements. Move on to quizzes and assignments, things that are a little more interactive. On to wikis, glossaries, and databases, which are more collaborative in nature. Um, then on to uh, forums that allow students to interact and having students rate each other in the forums. Uh, then activity sequences, kind of chaining activities together whether that's one lesson to the next or a quiz followed by a lesson, things like that, bringing in external activities, surveys, reflections, peer review. And then ultimately, he sees the pinnacle being that uh, the teachers ultimately go out and share what they've done in the community and become part of that larger uh, community that exists in Moodle.org. So the way I see his progression is, uh, one, he sees it as a vision for how teachers would typically progress through um, through their use of Moodle over the years as they grow and evolve. But I also see it kind of as a model for how we can help teachers progress so that they're not just stopping at content and uh, using Moodle as a file repository. The problem, though, is that this really isn't how people are using Moodle, or any LMS for that matter. Um, there are a number of studies that that confirm this information where people are finding that the majority, the overwhelming majority of LMS activity revolves around document management and instructor communication. So if you look at that in the Moodle context, that means people are posting resources, setting out assignments so students can submit files, and then using the news form to make announcements. How many of you would say that this covers the majority of your courses in your Moodle implementation? Not yours, of course, but others. If you were to look around the, the courses in your Moodle implementation. It says, yep, yep, yep. <laughs> yeah, 
sad but true. So like Martin, yeah, resource dumps, exactly. Like Martin, Annie and I really have a vision for something more. You know, we would really like to see teachers leverage a learning management system um, in the way that it, that's possible, right? To move beyond those content dumps, those content repositories, and use a learning management system to really engage learners um, in, in a constructivist or constructionist sort of way. So the trick is, is how, how we get people there. I know, right? <laughs> Heaven. <laughs> so how do we get people there? Thoughts about this? Have you had any luck getting people there? The heaven? But we'll have to just training, right? Bring people into training and you know, talk to them about this philosophy. Oh, yes, they need to be learners in the systems themselves. That, that's huge. Uh, I actually attended a conference recently, and the presenter was talking about research. Yeah, um, talking about research that says one of the greatest indicators of the efficacy of an online instructor is their experience as an online learner themselves. So people who have been learners in an online environment are more effective online instructors. Um, so that's a really good point. Yeah, get learners into the system themselves. It is very, very difficult because I think it takes too much time. Um, if they want to, and I think that's... Yeah, that's really important. And then we have to figure out how to how to help them realize the benefits, right? Lead by example, that's a good way to do it. It's on delivery and not the student. Yeah. And I think, I don't know, for myself, the evolution to more um, more interaction, more engagement, more collaboration is, uh, you know, once I had that first taste of that experience and what that was like to teach that way, um, it really hooked me, and I worked even harder to, to teach that way. So I, I think it's very challenging. There are lots of different directions we can go. Um, training is one possibility, whether that's online, face-to-face, -face, um, or a blended approach. The tough part is, is we can't train everyone, right? And training, there's, there's never enough time, never enough hours in the day, and it takes a long time to really change your approach or think differently about instruction, especially if you're looking around you and everyone else is doing content dumps. You know, it's, it takes a lot of effort to think about how to do it differently. So training has a, has a part, but I, I don't think it alone can do the job. So, uh, yes, you're like, perfect, Rob. Yes, the best learning happens at the point of need. That's kind of what Annie and I thought. So we said, um, and yeah, and people are at different stages, always at different stages in a training session. Um, so we thought, what if there was a wizard? Um, so a wizard that is integrated into Moodle to hit people at that point of need. Um, so let me elaborate a little bit. So I'm, I'm going to pull out Clippy, and I realize that some people have trauma associated with this or something. But um, it's the idea for the wizard is kind of like Clippy, but um, you know, like Clippy would kind of figure out what you're doing and make suggestions. But we don't want, you know, exactly Clippy because people don't like Clippy and he's kind of obnoxious. We want something a little more subtle, um, a little more available. You know, like Clippy wasn't very useful because people would always turn him off. Uh, yeah, the just-in-time wizard. Um, we need a new name for this, by the way, Clippy and Trauma. Yeah, <laughs> less arrogant. That would be good. Um, yeah. So th the problem is, is we, you know, we started out with this idea of a wizard, and then we realized it's not really a, a wizard because a wizard's more of a one-off. You know, like when I, um, oh, like, you know, Microsoft Office does have have wizards. It walks you through how to set up certain certain things, um, whereas this is more of an ongoing approach. So the model. The model that we kind of like, and there are a number of websites doing this, but um, it's like LinkedIn. If you've used LinkedIn, LinkedIn prompts you on occasion. You know, it says, hey, have you done this? Have you thought about this? Um, have you connected to these people? Do you know these guys? Have you thought about some recommendations? 
um, it just prompts you occasionally. It's not big. It's not in your face. It's not obnoxious. Uh, it doesn't disappear, you know, and never to be seen again. Uh, so when you do decide you want it, it's it's there. You can access it. But it doesn't get in the way and stop you from doing what you want to do. And in the conversations I've had and those that I've had with Annie, that's kind of our vision for whatever this thing is that's going to be integrated into Moodle, is it's just in time, there when you need it, but not in the way when you, when you don't. So, the, um, so we've got this idea, right? The problem with this idea, actually let me give you a couple more examples more specifics. Um, a couple of specific examples of how we see this working would be this uh, Moodle wizard would see like, oh, you have a collection of files in your course. Have you thought about a folder for bringing those together? Or have you tried a book? You know, do you want to check this out as, a, as an alternative way to present all this content? Or if the, if the teacher is creating the course and they have lots of assignments in the course, it might say, hey, you know, let's mix it up a little bit. Think about a forum. Try out the workshop. Uh, have you tried a marking guide? And the same thing could work for quizzes. And then on all of these options, as the learner sees, or as the instructor um, says, yeah, tell me about that folder thing, um, the instructor could say, give me the overview. That sounds good. I want to know more. Show me the settings. I need more information. Give me a video. Now give me some best practices. And it would allow the instructor to kind of dig deep and go as far as they want to go to get the information that they need to implement these tools effectively. So that's, that's the vision. Make sense? Got it? Questions? <laughs> Sounds good, right? Yeah. That's our hope. <laughs> Yay. Selection done via yeah. There's um, there's one online out there. I don't know if anyone has the link to that. Post it. But yeah, there there is a lesson out there that allows you to uh, kind of guide you through a tool selection process. And this will be a little bit. There's some similarities, but in this case, the the ideal wizard will recognize. It'll pick up on what you're doing in the course as a teacher, and then give you suggestions based on what you're doing. So kind of that anticipation aspect, whereas the, the lesson the teacher has to go seek out and, and make their way through. So this will hopefully be a little bit, a little bit smarter and more efficient and more of that just-in-time approach. But yeah, I'd expect that some of, the, some of the branches, some of the components will be the same. So um, we've got the idea. The problem is, is that we don't have any programming skills, Annie and I, and uh, we're, you know, we don't have a budget, a budget to uh, find someone to build this. So um, and we've also got this added, uh, this addition that we have courses we're taking and we have course requirements and we have projects we have to do. So we decided to take this idea and use it for one of our course projects. So we were taking a course, and in the course we were supposed to design a technology-based learning environment. And so we decided to take our wizard idea and turn it into a course that, uh, you know, it is a technology-based learning environment. The advantage of doing this is that it allows us to think through the whole wizard idea. So as we're thinking about this, outlining the, the project idea, we're thinking, okay, so it's not really going to be the wizard itself, because um, that's probably more than a semester's worth of work, but it'll be a prototype of sorts to help us think about how this wizard might work. And, and it did do that. Uh, we also wanted to create a course that would provide adaptive, personalized content. So kind of that anticipation that we were talking about, where the course says, ah, oh, you look like you might need. Uh, we also wanted to use progress bars and checklists uh, or completion tracking to help convey to the, learner, to the learner where they are in the course, where they are in terms of the information. Because if you're going to present a, um, an adaptive course with every learner going a slightly different direction, they'll need some way to keep track of where they are and how they've progressed. 
And then we thought we could also use some badges and certificates because everybody likes badges and uh, gamification and those will be things that the learners can use to document where they've gotten to and be used for motivational, motivational purposes. And then the other thing we wanted to do with this project is we thought we really want to leverage the Moodle community resources that are out there. That it's very silly, <coughs> it's silly for us uh, to spend our time rewriting content that already lives in the Moodle docs and in the Moodle demonstration sites um, all over Moodle.org. So uh, and we also thought if we design the wizard this way, then maybe there's um, in the long term a way to build the wizard ultimately that uses those same resources so that uh, it's less work to maintain. So the weakness of this idea of using this project to uh, prototype our wizard is that you know our, our attention was a bit divided. So we're trying to think about how to meet the requirements of the course, uh, how to design a course that doesn't do exactly what the wizard is going to do, but kind of helps simulate it. Um, and then also thinking about as we go along, like, oh, that's a good idea for the wizard, and trying to capture that off to the side. But um, in the end, I think the process really did inspire some new ideas that we wouldn't have had if we had done the wizard only, if we'd done the wizard alone. And uh, we've also helped us to think of some neat things to do within the Moodle course that we wouldn't have thought of, I think, if we were thinking only about a Moodle course. With that, I'm going to turn it over to Annie, and let her talk more about the course design and um, you through a demonstration. Okay, so I'm Annie, um, and thank you, Michelle, for, for showing everyone in the background or describing the background of the project. My audio was kind of crackly toward the end of your talking, so if you can't understand me, hear me, let me know, and maybe I can tag you again, Michelle. Uh, so <clears throat> this course that we created, uh, we, the target audience were Moodlers, and the topic was course development. We wanted them to be able to make courses. And the purpose is so that learners can learn better, right? So we wanted people to, like Michelle was describing, to be able to use the more advanced interactive capabilities of Moodle and use more constructivist or student-centered um, techniques, <clears throat> use those tools to, to help the learners really be the, the person, the main person involved in their learning. So I'll just skim through some of this other, this, uh, these details about the course because I really want to spend some time on showing you what we did, what we built in the course. Uh, the, the objectives were to, like I said, was to, to create a course. We wanted them to be part of a community of practice, not only within their own, among their own learners, but also joining the Moodle, the Moodle, Moodle community, um, and then reflect on their, on their Moodle skills and try and make goals for themselves and, and assess whether they were reaching those goals. So like we were saying before, trainings don't situate learning in a meaningful environment. And we wanted to do that with this course. So Moodle course creation, obviously, is very well suited to the Moodle LMS. And we're going to have these students build a course right there in Moodle along with us. And we'll be, we'll be mentoring them as we go. And they'll be using the content to, to guide them through this, uh, just like the wizard would guide them in this theoretical um, setting when they're building their courses. We talked about doing a six-week six-week semi-self-paced course, meaning that people could join at any point. We wanted to, to uh, limit it to six weeks so that, that you would still have a community. At some point during that six weeks, you're going to overlap with, with some people for a period of time and be able to talk with them and develop relationships and, and discuss with each other in the forums and hopefully develop this in-class community of practice. Uh, the tools or the technology that we're using to help make this, this uh, content more accessible are the Moodle lessons from, uh, that, we, that we developed using the Google Docs and videos developed by Moodle, uh, screen captures and links to these resources. We also will have weekly synchronous meetings and these would, um, these would foster community and they would be just question and answer sessions because people would be at different points in their coursework but uh, or in their in their course creation work, 
but they would um, probably have questions that could benefit everyone. So we decided to stick with, with question and answer meetings. Our course design follows that progression from Martin to Guillamas. We wanted to first introduce them to, to, uh, uh, to our course and help them tell us more about their course. We wanted to personalize it. And that meant a little bit of, of pre-assessment, of knowing where they're going, what they need, so that we can, can um, uh, cater the content directly to them. So not every learner would get exactly the same thing out of the course. Um, and then we would, we would take them through these different steps of, um, of learning about the Moodle tools and, and how you can use Moodle in these more uh, advanced ways. Uh, let's see. Yeah, yeah, exactly, Michelle. We, thanks for, for answering that, the self-enrollment. We would, we would probably do that. So we're using the, I'm not sure if this is a trademarked phrase, choose your own adventure. We wanted them to be able to not, uh, not have to go through every bit of the content, but really take and choose the things that were important to them at that point. Um, if they wanted to, to build a course with lessons, they could take, take information about the lesson. If they wanted to use um, workshops, they could just go straight to the workshop and be able to, to really piece together the information they needed without being distracted by some of the extra stuff that, they, that wasn't important to them at the time. And this type of course, we were concerned that it might, we might lose learners because it was so open and, um, and not your typical linear type of course. And so we've tried to incorporate some direction into it. We're going to use a course map that's always available in a, in a, Oh, I, Michelle is so fluent with the Moodle terms. Now I'm losing it. We in a doc, in a a block. Thank you. <laughs> um, always available in a block on the side that they can click on and see what is hidden in the course, what they they need to, which path they need to follow to open that, and uh, and we hope that that will help direct them. We also using menus inside the lessons and prompts saying, okay, you finish this. Now go on to click in this next. This next bar just just prompts within the lessons and within the course material. And another thing that I know has been uh, of interest here at this conference are progress bars. We've we've taken a progress bar. Maybe Michelle, you can put in the link to the the progress bar plugin. Um, it, but these progress bars will will help the students see what they have completed and what they've missed, and whether whether they want to or not, they can. Or, excuse me. It's up to them if they choose to. They can return back to those those things that they glossed over or skipped entirely and, go, and fix those. But we just wanted them to be aware of what's available and what they've done. Then we're also using completion tracking, which helps them check off um, either manually or automatically check off the things that they've completed. Thanks, Michelle. So the activities that were involved is this project, the, the main core of the course. They'll develop their own course. We included some discussions, some learner-generated facts. So the learners will ask questions and answer their own questions um, and messaging. We chose to assess the learners with a checkpoint quiz. Uh, as we grow the course into some of the more, uh, we will add more quizzes. Right now we just have one. And we have peer review evaluation and completion tracking. will also help us see and the learners see what they've what they've done and how they're progressing through the course. So we want to we wanted to support the learners by gradually giving them this content rather than overwhelming them with it all at once and and using these other um, forms of support. And I think next we are to our demonstration. So hold on to your hats. See it's uploading for you. Okay. Oh, I went too far. Excuse me. So this is what the learner will see when they enter the course. And this is all they'll see. It doesn't, you can't scroll down past this. You'll see up in the top right a progress bar. And like I said, right now it's empty because this student, um, who was actually my husband, tried it out for us last night so I could get some fresh screenshot. Uh, this student hadn't completed anything in the course, so it's all blue. But as he progresses through that, um, 
he would get a green check mark, or if he skipped something, a red X. And I, I showed you that, that we would help the students with facts and peer-to-peer, uh, -peer, well, that was the peer-to-peer -peer facts, but also they have the opportunity to ask an expert. And they can go to this, to this block here to get that information anytime or to, to, to get a link to those forms anytime. And this is the course map that I talked about earlier, showing all of the hidden stuff and all of the available stuff and how to, how to get to that. Oh, I need to show you where I'm going to click now. Now I'm going to click on this Start Here button. So this is the start of their content. And, and this here is the completion tracking square. When my husband finishes this lesson, it will have a, a check mark on it, I think a blue check mark on it. So when he opens the Start Here button, uh, he enters this lesson where we introduce ourselves. We have a, an interactive video to develop teacher presence and help the students feel like there's a human actually involved in, in their online course. Two humans, actually. <laughs> um, we point them to, to, uh, to their help. And I'm, I'm shortening this lesson. There's more information there, contact information and, uh, and other important introductory things. And then we want to direct them to where to go next. So these are, these are the prompts within the lesson. Um, you see up here, we're going to tell them that when the, when the lesson ends, they need to click on this link to take them back to the main course. We also point out that they need to go, their next step is to go to the peer-to-peer -peer question and answer form. We wanted them to see that. So we're, we're actually forcing them through conditional activities to go there. We want them to be able to access that information. Um, and, and we don't want to leave it up to them at this point in the course. To, to maybe miss it. We want them to see it. So they are required to go click on that in order for more information to open up. And then it's important to point out the, the cookie trail here. The, they're the breadcrumb trail. That'll show them how to get back to the, the main course. Down here at the bottom, this is separate from the progress bar that we talked about at the top right um, part of the class. This is only embedded in the course, and it shows whether they're close to the end. Or excuse me embedded in the lesson itself, and, and it shows how, how much farther they have, I'm sure. Many of you know that. So he clicked on that button successfully, and he got back to the main, the main course page. And these, this part that I've highlighted here is new. These three links just appeared because they were conditional upon completing that first lesson. So now we hope that he was a good instruction follower and he comes and clicks here on the peer-to-peer -peer question and answer forum. And he did, lucky us, lucky him. <laughs> so once he completes that, it's automatically ticked off with the completion tracking. And his progress bar updates. And I apologize, there are actually three checks on here because I took the progress bar um, screenshot late. But but it would, at this point, it would actually only have two check marks because he had completed two of the activities. But that progress bar is a really helpful feature. I was just watching a session uh, yesterday, I believe, um, that showed that their students, that was the key factor in their students completing their coursework. They, they pulled their students and, and they reported that the most important element in the course that helped them complete the coursework was the progress bar. So it's a very helpful uh, tool there. So having completed that peer-to-peer -peer forum, opened up through conditional activities, then the first lesson, well, I guess not the first lesson. Uh, good to hear, Josh. Yeah, you were in that session with me, weren't you? Or Josh, um, maybe you weren't. I don't remember. Anyhow, I'm glad to hear that, that you've had the same experience. So, um, uh, this is our first lesson. Now, I told you that we needed to assess our learners so that we could individualize it. So this is our first, or this is our pre-assessment, and it's going to tell us who these learners are and what kind of information they need. And on the surface, this lesson looks really simple, or to the learner, it looks quite simple. And I don't want to, I don't want to, um, I, I don't want to discourage you from doing it. It takes a bit of work, but if you can, if you can put in the work, to do it, uh, you can personalize your entire course and make the <clears throat> make a, a huge difference. I I believe in your students learning because they know that you thought about them and that what is in the course is going to be relevant to them. So 
uh, depending on your situation and your time and the amount of that time that you're going to be able to use your courses, you might consider this type of a creative assessment. We use the lesson, but you could also use a quiz. It needs to be something that is, is uh, not linear and is scorable, or something that has choices that they can choose and tell you about themselves. So we're using a lesson here. And I'm going to click on this link, planning your course structure. <clears throat> so this takes us to a series of questions. What we want to know is just I want to know what type of course they were creating. Um, so we're going to ask a series of questions about what their, what their course looks like or what they plan for their course to look like. So first we want to know is it blended or online? Did uh, my husband says he can make a blended course? We'll see how that goes. <laughs> Oh dear, sorry. We'll wait and see. Does it help if I slow down? Okay. Well, I'll try and speak slower. And if it gets bad, we'll switch. Okay, Michelle? <clears throat> So my husband clicked on blended course, and now we give him the option to choose a project-based course, a, a skills development course, a theory or discussion course, or a large lecture course. So these are some typical course structures, and we feel like most courses would fall in one of these four. So he chose the large lecture course. We also needed to know if we were going to let his, his students work through the course on their own, like a MOOC, well, not necessarily like a MOOC, but a self-paced course, or if this was going to be a cohort-paced course, meaning that the whole class would work through the units at the same time. So he's going to choose a cohort-paced course. We want to confirm that that's what he meant to tell us. You've chosen a blended, large lecture, cohort-based course. And then I give him some information about those large lecture courses. And, and I, uh, there are three or four pages about this, and I didn't include it all here. <clears throat> and now I wanted to confirm whether this was indeed, having known what we, the way we define a blended, cohort-based, large lecture course, we want to confirm that this is really what he intends to do. So he can exit the lesson with no score attached and return to it later, or he can explore those options again, and he can choose a different path down that, that uh, series of questions and choose something else before he submits. Or he can submit what he's chosen and move on. So he's pretty confident that he's going to He's going to build a blended cohort-paced large lecture course, and he, he submitted that. And that triggers an individualized guide for creating that exact type of course. You see these numbers here. That's my little code for a large lecture blended cohort-based course. And this will stay here for, his, for the remainder of his course, so he can refer back to it. It has tips for which tools might be helpful and ways to engage learners in that setting. So this was our assessment of who these learners are, and it will help us define how we, how we make the rest of our, our content. And in reality, we didn't personalize a lot of this other content because we ran out of time and it's a work in progress. But here is the next, um, the next unit adding content to your course. And I'll just show you a little bit about what each of these units look like. We remember, we're using the Google Docs, and we are just showing them how to use these tools at this point. So adding content, here's an overview of this lesson. It describes what you're going to see through the next lesson. It has links to those pages in case you want to get right to business. So Andrew is asking, yeah, so if he made changes to the lesson, and I know we thought this through, Michelle, didn't we? I think in the end we decided that the only option, given the settings in the lesson, 
if he changed his mind while he, before he submitted, it's no problem. There's no scoring attached, and there's no problem with that. If he changed his mind after he submitted, we had to, uh, he has to notify the teacher, and they have to clear that score. Because otherwise, I think the lesson, the only option was to take the highest score, and because these are not, um, these are not grading scores, these are just identification scores, that, that wouldn't work. Yeah, exactly. So into this lesson again, yeah, we did, we worked on, on that for a long time. Uh, after, after the student goes through the content overview, they click on the lesson, which will give them the content for the tools that will be described in this lesson. So an introduction to what the lesson is about. And then here at the bottom, the student can go directly to the resource that interests them. Or up here in the lesson menu, they can navigate to exactly what they want. So this is the, a bit of the individualization in the course. We wanted them to see all of these at a, at a light level, but uh, so that they would know what was available, so they could know what, what is possible with their courses. But we don't expect people to go into the settings and the descriptions of really best practices within those tools unless they really expect to use it, because that would just be overload. So we go into this file resource page. And this is one page, one example of, of what you'd see in the lesson. And it goes, it goes on into best practices, what, when not to use a file resource, when to use a, a file resource, and settings. I didn't include all of those slides in here, but they are there. So this is a view now of that block on the right side. You see that his progress bar has updated again, and he's doing quite quite swimmingly in the course anytime. You can click on the help buttons or the form. Excuse me, that's not a button. That's just a, an icon. But you can click on this forum link or ask the expert link. And at any time, you can click on the course map to find direction in the course. So now I want to take you under the hood. Oh, no, excuse me. Here's the course map. Ta-da. <laughs> so I used, uh, made this using Mindomo. I don't know if you guys have used that. It's a brainstorming tool. But we, we found actually Mindomo was really useful in mapping out these, um, these decision trees or these choices that the students would make. So I also used Mindomo for making the, um, for mapping out the different paths in that, in that pre-assessment lesson. Now here's under the hood. This is what the teacher sees. You can see that we have, um, we've, hidden some of these based on uh, completion. And we wanted to do that so that the learners wouldn't get distracted or overwhelmed, so that it was uh, very directed, especially in the beginning. And once, once they got the hang of it, they got the feel of the course, uh, we expected that they would, um, they would not be quite so intimidated by a lot of, of uh, by more content than just the, the few links in the beginning. So here's what the, the conditions on, on that first uh, getting started unit are. These, these are hidden until after, they've, until after they have introduced themselves, or no, excuse me, until after they've hit that peer-to-peer -peer forum. Now that pre-assessment lesson, um, this took up a lot of our mind power and a lot of our, our energy, but again, I don't want you to, uh, to be intimidated by this. You can do it much in, in a very simple way. We decided we wanted to know a lot about these people because if this wizard thing comes to something and we, and we can build it, we would be catering to all Moodlers. And we wanted to, to really tailor it to them. So we actually have 18 paths in this lesson. And that resulted, so if you were to open up this lesson structure, you would see 18 paths with about, um, uh, I don't know, four to six pages each. Um, and they each trigger a unique 
guide to your course. So you see here's one guide to your course, a second guide to your course. And I had to code these. Maybe I should tell you this because this, again, it took a lot of brain power to figure out how to make it unique. But I coded these so I could, I could, um, uh, so I could identify one just by the numbers at the end. So one was, now I can't remember, an online course, I believe. Two was, um, or the second digit here was whether they use synchronous interactions or asynchronous interactions. And the fourth one was, or the third one is that course type. Is it a large lecture, a, um, a, a skills development course, or so on? So each of these numbers represents something, and that was how we were able to come up with these identifications. We like to make things difficult. Yeah, exactly. And maybe some of you have a better way of doing this. We tried do, using a quiz, but we weren't able to um, make the scores unique, and we weren't able to do that loop to help people change, see what they were going to do, and then maybe change their mind and come back to it before they submitted. So that was that was a uh, let's see. Uh, yeah, thank you, Michelle. Sorry. So that was how we developed our course, and. Um, and how we made it personalized and, and somewhat adaptive. And of course, there's still, you could do a lot with it, but by just knowing who they are and giving them some personalized information, we felt like we had made some big steps in, um, in an adaptability and, and personalization in Moodle. And we were really pleased to see that the tools in Moodle enabled that, that they, they let, allow you to do that. So what is XMind? That's a mind mapping tool, Stuart? Um, so we're, does anyone have any questions at this point? Okay, Michelle, I'll turn it back over to you to to summarize and wrap up. Great, okay. Um, one thing that I wanted to add to or elaborate on on the screen that we're seeing here, um, just as you're thinking about how you might use these tools in your own courses, realize that within the lesson itself that you can deliver this unique content, right? So. The learner goes through the lesson, they pick their kinds of courses, um, the environment they're working in, and then within the lesson we do actually deliver um, the recommendations, the strategies for that kind of, of course. The added extra step of doing the book in this case is designed to allow the learner to have access to that information outside of the lesson all the way through the course because with the adaptive lesson, um, and Annie, I think your mic is still on. Um, with, the adapt, um, with the adaptive lesson, the only way for the learner to get back to that content uh, would be to go back through the lesson all the, way, all the way through again, which is not very efficient. You want to make that information, that guide, available to them uh, throughout the course as they're building their own course. So we decided the best way to do that is to make it available, available in a book and then that's where that came in, that you had to create so many different variations on the book. So if you're looking for just a small step of, you know, uh, starting small with adaptive content or personalized content, you could do a ton within the lesson. I think the, the biggest trick or the weakness of the lesson at this point is if you want to launch other activities based on the results of a lesson, that becomes more challenging. Um, and like Annie said, we played with using multiple choice questions through the lesson to try to determine a score, to you know, push the learners to the next point. Um, and, and that may work in some cases, depending on the kind of content or questions you're asking. But in the end, we found what we needed to do is you know, use branches and paths throughout that lesson. So the good news is, is that at the Moodle conference, and I talked about this Wednesday night too, at the Moodle conference in Scotland recently, I had a conversation with a couple of developers from, uh, from HQ that seemed interested in picking up the lesson and working on improving it. Uh, 
because to this point, it's kind of just been out there and, main, you know, maintaining the status quo. So hopefully we can continue those conversations with the developers and get some of these improvements into the lesson so that uh, Annie and I can do things like this without having to work so hard at it. So, oh, David has taken it over officially. Fantastic. That's great. That's great. Yeah, we were doing some brainstorming at the moot. And uh, the nice thing is we have a good use case here for, <laughs> for you know, this functionality and what you might need. Great, David will do a good job. <clears throat> so next steps uh, with the wizard and with the wizard course. So the course itself, uh, what we would like to do is complete development because there are lots of holes. There's lots of information that's not included yet. There's information that could go much further. There's more adaptation and more personalization that could be incorporated. Uh, it just takes time. There's a lot of information there. Um, if you're interested in helping out with that, uh, then send us an email and we'll put our contact information at the end here. And uh, we're happy to, to let you take part and show you, you know, behind the scenes how it's all done. And then we want to test it out. Like we said, we want to do maybe a six-week launch of the course, kind of an open environment, let people come in and play, use it, see what they think. And then our goal ultimately is to release it to the wild. So uh, release it on, uh, let's see, Moodle.net. They've changed the name. So Moodle.net and uh, make it Creative Commons so that if anyone finds value in it, they can use it and do whatever they'd like with it. Then our, our ultimate goal, our real vision, our passion, is to actually get this kind of wizard thing built into Moodle. To do that, we need to define the design. Uh, more than what we have so far, uh, get into more detail on the map and things like that and say this is exactly how it's going to work, this is what it's going to look like, or at least our vision of it, and um, map, the, map the interactions. Uh, so when I was talking to Martin about this at the, at the Moodle conference, um, he said basically what we need to do is we need to come up with a series of if-then statements. You know, if if the instructor does this, then show them this. If they do this, show them this. So we have lots of if-then statements to write, lots of thinking to do. And then um, hopefully the developers will let us play with them, and we can work with them to, do, to help implement uh, this and really, truly get it into Moodle, which, you know, as a Moodle groupie is like the, the ultimate goal. Um, <laughs> to get something like that would be really cool. So I would be happy to test. Good. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. And I think the trick, honestly, will be is you could go, yeah, I'm a little groupy. Um, I think the trick will be for us, uh, if we're developing this on our own, of course that is, is to figure, to figure out where to stop. Because I think you could continue to personalize and personalize and personalize. And um, I, I don't know, I don't know honestly. Um, whether this course has a lot of value to real users or if it's just been, you know, served its purpose by helping us think through the wizard. I'm not sure about that. So, yeah, everyone's a Moodle groupie. <laughs> um, made use of walk me. I have not for walking people through things. That's interesting. I'm going to have to write that down. So questions, comments? <laughs> yeah, that's uh, me for Moodle. Yeah, so our, our vision for this actually, Sam, is um, I'm, I'm mapping out my dissertation topic as we speak. And my plan is to do a dissertation um, to research whether or not teachers really do follow this progression that Martin has talked about, to take a look at people over, over their their experience with Moodle, you know, people have been using Moodle for six months, somebody else has been using it for a year, and see, you know, if they evolve, do they evolve in this way, in this pattern, and then that will provide background research for the, for the wizard, and then we'll test the wizard and see if it actually does, does anything useful that helps move people along more than just leaving them to, to their own devices. But I think, I, I think it would be really cool to have this just-in-time kind of support within Moodle um, to help teachers go beyond what 
what might be easy or intuitive right up front. If there are no other questions, then I've got a few links and uh, contact information for you. Uh, first, Annie and I uh, have partnered with a couple of other students from our PhD program to set up a blog. It's, it's still young, just a couple of posts, but it's there. And uh, if you're interested in hearing more of what we have to say, uh, then we are actually launching a course, Intro to Online Teaching course, starting June 4th. And uh, we did a presentation on that on Wednesday, so you can catch that recording or uh, go to my slide share page and see the slides there or go to learningbysharing.com slash teaching online. You'll also find the call for participation at Learning by Sharing. So we're really interested to get people to participate in that course and help us test it out so we can do research on it and then um, you know, hopefully make it better too. And then here's our contact information, email addresses, slide share, Twitter, all that good stuff. Questions, comments before we wrap it up? Oh, thanks, Rob and Christine. Wait till it's done either. <laughs> the challenge are so many interesting things to work on and do. Thanks so much. Hi, Michelle and Eddie. Just uh, Shane here again. Um, just wanted to thank you once again from, on behalf of the whole IMIT team for um, sharing today. It's great. Thank you.